This tricky topic discusses how intelligence is measured and how we have arrived at the current paradigm of intelligence testing. Before getting into how we measure intelligence, we must first ask, what is intelligence? What are we really measuring when we talk about intelligence? What do we currently value in society as being intelligent? Is it the mathematical mind of Einstein? Or perhaps the artistic genius of Picasso? Or is it both? Nevertheless, it's important to understand how society's views on intelligence have changed and how, as a result, the testing of intelligence has changed as well. If we look back at the history of IQ testing, we see that it has changed and evolved for both practical and theory-driven reasons, where in general the history of intelligence tests can be divided into three distinct historical periods. Intelligence testing as an idea was first coined in 1865 by Sir Francis Dalton in England. However, it wasn't until the early 1900s that intelligence was first measured in a practical and clinical context. The first practical test was devised by French psychologist Alfred Binet, and this was a test that he made consisting of 30 problems of increasing difficulty, where the score was then determined by the patient's mental age divided by the chronological age multiplied by 100, which gave a score referred to as the intelligence quotient or IQ. And this method of scoring very clearly became problematic across different ages. For example, let's say you have a 30 and 40 year old man. To begin, let's say the 30 year old man scored a 30 on this test. So let's say he has a mental age of 30 and a chronological age of 30 as well. So his score would therefore be his mental age divided by his chronological age times 100, which gives a score of 100 for his IQ. This contrasts with the 40 year old man who has a score of 30 on the test as well. So that gives him a mental age of 30 and a chronological age of 40, where his score would come out to an intelligence quotient of 75. So even though these two men did exactly the same on the test itself, because of their difference in age, the 40 year old man had an IQ score three quarters that of the 30 year old man's score. So this problem is evidently very prominent and became addressed in the 1930s by David Weschler. And David Weschler distinguished between adults and children as having fundamentally different cognitive abilities, and he devised respective intelligence tests for children and adults, allowing for the negation of chronological age and scoring altogether. David Weschler devised two tests. The first one is the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scales, and the second being the Weschler Intelligence Scale for children. Now, the second era of intelligence testing came in the 1980s with the Kaufman Assessment Battery for Children, and this was an intelligence test that directly challenged the Weschler intelligence test in four specific ways. The first being that it was guided by theories of fluid and crystallized intelligence and Piaget's theory of cognitive development. The second, it recognized fundamentally different intelligence characteristics for different ages amongst children. The third, it measures several different aspects of intelligence. And finally, it assessed different types of learning styles. So following this, the third and current era came in the 1990s, for intelligence tests began to recognize the many different facets and measures of intelligence. Carroll took Cattell-Horn theory and analyzed all known intelligence tests, linking different models on intelligence from single qualities to multidimensional models. This has set up the current paradigm of intelligence tests that assess different forms of intelligence. So for example, we'll look at the fourth version of the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale and the Weschler Intelligence Scale for Children that was released in 2008. And these tests now include four different dimensions of intelligence. These are verbal comprehension, working memory, perceptual reasoning, and processing speed. So now that we understand what the current paradigm of intelligence tests are actually measuring, it's now important to look at and address how individuals are scored and ranked within current intelligence tests. We cannot describe the scoring of IQ tests without first discussing the very basic ideas behind the theory referred to as the central limit theorem. This is also a part of the probability theory. And to define it, the central limit theorem states that a group of independent, random variables of a significant quantity will be normally distributed. And this sounds like a mouthful, but we'll try and highlight this in the next example where we'll look at the heights of individuals in a certain population. So when we look at a group of individuals, 
Each person's height is independent of all others as well as random within the population. So if we then took this group and began to bin them based on their heights, according to the central limit theorem, they would follow a specific type of distribution as these individuals are both independent to one another and random within the group. And again, the distribution they would follow is termed a normal distribution. So if we then plot the heights of all the individuals in the population into a histogram, as you can see here, and then plot the curve of this histogram, we should see what's described as a bell curve. It's important to know that the bell curve on the histogram becomes smoother and more continuous as the number of individuals in the population we're looking at increases. Where a really large population following a normal distribution would look more like this curve, extremely continuous and smooth. And to look further into a normal distribution, what we see is that there are three main characteristics that hold true across all population measures that are shown to be normally distributed. The first being that the mean, median, and mode are all equal. The second being that the distribution is symmetrical. So 50% of the data or individual counts fall on either side of the center. Finally, the distribution is uniform, such that the standard deviation, which is the measure of how spread out the numbers are from the mean, is constant in a normal distribution, such that one standard deviation encompasses approximately 68% of individuals. Two standard deviations encompass approximately 95% of the individuals. Three standard deviations encompass approximately 99.7% of the individuals within that normal distribution. So now, just like the heights of individuals, we can also use IQ scores on a frequency plot that will be normally distributed. That is, IQ scores of individuals also follow a normal distribution, where in this case they have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So scores from approximately 90 to 110 are termed average, scores less than 70 are extremely low, and scores greater than 130 are very superior. As a quick example, let's say you score 115 on your IQ test. So this means that you have an above average score that is within the 84th percentile, meaning that you fall in the top 16% of scores. This tricky topic covered both what intelligence tests are measuring and how individuals are scored and ranked relative to others based on their IQ. Thanks for listening.